Hello, hello. Welcome back, friends, to Alpha Beta Soup, where we unpack Bitcoin using on-chain analysis. I'm TXMC, and today I've got something special for you. As price continues hanging around in the low 60Ks looking for support, I think today is a great opportunity to bring together many of the concepts we've spoken about throughout the course of this channel and boil down for you what I think is happening to Bitcoin big picture and what we can expect over the next few months, maybe years. So get comfortable. We've got a lot of cool things to talk about, and I'm glad you're here for it. If you're enjoying my content, make sure you give this video a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to my channel. You're watching the best on-chain community on YouTube, and I could not be more grateful to have your support. Now that we've gotten introductions out of the way, let's get into the charts. We'll quickly glance at the price chart here. Bitcoin has been hanging around in the 60K range for the last few days, and we may continue to hang out here for the rest of the week. The market seems content to consolidate in this range for a period of time. And the longer we bump up against these 60K prices, just as we spoke about when we were bumping up against 50K prices, the longer we continue to do this, the more normal these values become. And eventually, 60K will seem like a value price for Bitcoin. But right now, the market is still recovering from a recent all-time high break and gathering support. There isn't much to say about it beyond that right now until a direction is established. We check out the weekly chart. We can see we're still flagging here right at the all-time high. We've got a light pullback, no big huge selling wicks here, and we're trying to gather some support right around 60k. And if we go over here to the monthly chart, we just had a monthly close yesterday on Halloween. If we mark the top of this close, you can see it's the highest monthly close price in Bitcoin's history, passing the April close. The month of October saw a 40% increase in the price for Bitcoin, which if I go back and look is the highest single month of gains since December of 2020, when we had a 47% month. The market does look strong. There's very light selling pressure. And what I want to talk about today are the overall supply dynamics for Bitcoin. In my first video for this channel, we laid out some foundational observations about how we thought Bitcoin was creating a supply squeeze coming out of the summer. That thesis has played out so far, but we've touched on a lot of these topics throughout the videos that have followed, and it's been a while since we brought them all together into a cohesive narrative. So today, as we hang out around 61,000, I'm going to lay out for you what we're seeing in the underlying supply dynamics now for Bitcoin and how it's been evolving in the last year and a half. I'll show you the trends that we're seeing and some of the new paradigm shifts that I believe are demonstrating a maturity for Bitcoin that will carry us into the future and perhaps redefine the behaviors we expect from Bitcoin holders going forward. So let's get right into it. Here are liquid and illiquid supply. At Glassnode, we have methods for identifying individual participants on chain. We can group their addresses together based on heuristics and identifying certain behaviors on chain. And once we've identified individuals and grouped their addresses, we then have their spending history. What liquid and illiquid supply are doing is breaking up those on-chain entities by their likelihood to sell. A liquid entity, or a highly liquid entity, which are shown here in red and orange, are entities that are more favorable to selling. A highly liquid entity, here in red, is an entity that has a history of selling at least 75% of the Bitcoin that they purchase, lifetime. A liquid entity, here in orange, is in the middle. They sell between 25 and 75% of their Bitcoin, right in the middle. And the illiquid types, the ones here in blue, illiquid types sell 25% or less of their Bitcoin. They are not favorable to selling. Some of them have no history of selling. And these are what we would consider the hodlers. These are the strong hands. And the reason I want to show this chart, let's take illiquid off of here. So what we're looking at now are only liquid and highly liquid entities. These are the folks that have a history of selling, or they are at least favorable to the idea of selling. They're not opposed to it. And what we can observe about these groups is that for the first decade or so of Bitcoin's life, 
their share of the supply was growing. Coins were coming to life, they were becoming active, and they were in the hands of owners that were not opposed to moving them around. This trend continued in every bull market in 2011, in 2013 and 14, and in 2017. Liquid supply was on the uptick. Until this moment here in mid-2020, around March, when we had a liquidity crunch that hit all markets, we had an economic crisis, and all of the fallout from the C-19 scares, all of those things culminated in liquid supply beginning a downtrend. And since March of 2020, it has been in a decline, with one exception here in May when the sell-off occurred from the all-time high, when there was a burst of supply back into liquid hands. Since then, it has resumed downtrending. So what does this mean? What I believe this is showing is that in the last year and a half, the idea of hodling and not selling your Bitcoin the concept of Bitcoin as a superior store of value is beginning to take root. More and more investors are taking supply away from these liquid entities and are storing it and they don't intend to sell them. These are people who have a proven history of not selling and they are acquiring supply away from these liquid entities. This is a new paradigm that didn't exist in previous bull markets, but exists this year in 2020 and 2021 as we're up into new all-time highs. So that's our first observation today, that liquid supply, supply owned by folks with a history of selling, is on the decline and has been in steady decline for 18 months. This is the balance of BTC across all exchanges. One thing you may notice is that it shares a similar shape and profile to the liquid supply arc over time. Exchange balances were on the increase for a steady, I would say seven years or so, from 2013 until 2020. And they increased in each bull market that we had exchanges for. So in 2013 and 14, exchange balances are going up throughout the entire bear market of 2014 to 2016, they were going up. And then in the bull market of 16 and 17, they were going up. This continued until March of 2020, which as we were just discussing was a pivotal moment for the markets. A lot of things changed in March of 2020. The money printer got turned on in overdrive and the Fed just began devaluing the dollar at a record pace. And what did we see happen to Bitcoin in that time? Well, the price did crash in March of 2020. There was a brief crash, but as it recovered, the balance on exchanges began declining. And for those who don't understand, in on-chain analysis, we consider coins being taken off exchanges to be a bullish sentiment. When you take a coin off the exchange and you put it into cold storage, you're creating friction between possession of that coin and the ability to sell it. In order to sell it to someone else to get rid of your Bitcoin, you have to put them on an exchange and place them for sale. So having them off the exchange and actively taking them away makes a statement about your intent for those coins. So we can assume that when we see exchange balances in decline, that we are seeing hodlers take supply away from willing buyers. They don't have an intention of selling them anytime soon because they're moving them into cold storage. They're not leaving them on the exchange as they easily could. So exchange balances have been in decline since March of 2020, with this one exception here in May during the sell-off after the all-time high. There was an exodus of coins. A few people rushed to the exits. It spent a period of time, here I'll zoom in, it spent a period of time being a bit flat and since then has resumed declining and has stayed in decline throughout September and October as price has rallied back to the all-time high. So we have this dynamic here of exchange balances on the rise for many years through multiple bull run cycles until March of 2020 when many things changed about the US dollar and the economic outlook globally. And since then, Bitcoin's exchange balances have seen a steady decline, consistent outflows to cold storage and sovereign custody. Likewise, with liquid supply, many years of growth through many bull markets until March of 2020, the global economic outlook changes and liquid supply begins declining and stays in a decline. So these two forces of exchange balance declining and liquid supply declining are new wrinkles in a bull market for Bitcoin. This profile did not exist before. That's very interesting to me. And we'll come back to this in a bit. But let's keep going. Here is minor net position change. So the miners are a source of consistent sell pressure on the network. 
Some miners are full-fledged businesses with operating costs that they need to take care of, revenue they need to produce, and so they're selling coins strategically to remain profitable and invest in their business for the future. There are also mining pools that are made up of many individuals and smaller groups that pool their hash power together and split up the rewards. All of those different groups create the miner economy. And what has been true for the miner economy for much of Bitcoin's life is that the miners produce constant sell pressure. So the way this net position change chart works is that when you see a red value, when you see negative red values, that is showing outflows over a rolling 30-day period. Green values are inflows, are growth over a 30-day period. So when we talk about minor position change, this is about the balance of BTC in all wallets owned by miners. This is their treasury. When we see green values, they are adding coins to their treasury. When we see red values, they are dipping into their purse, pulling out Bitcoin, and selling them. There are some Bitcoin that don't ever make it to their treasury. They just get burned immediately. And it's, it's about 85 to 90% of all mined Bitcoin gets sold on a regular basis. Basis, historically. But the reason we're talking about minor position change now is because it too is evolving. We talked about liquid supply being on the decline for the last 18 months. We talked about exchange balances being on the decline as well after years of growth. Now we're talking about the miners. The miners are typically a consistent source of sell pressure. Here we're looking at the 2014 to 2017 market. And what you can see is in bear periods, miners are selling with a bit of accumulation. There's some pockets where they ease off of their selling, but mostly they're selling. And then as price is finding strength and breaking the previous all-time high, they begin selling in mass. So you can see they're very reflexive to price moving up they find it enticing, and they tend to sell even more. Let's move the slider here into the future. Something is changing with the way the miners operate. Since the middle of 2019, when some of the newer generation of ASICs came online, the miner economy began evolving. A lot of the old Wild West miners that existed for the first few years have gone out of business. The miners that are remaining are becoming increasingly sophisticated in their operations. They're becoming more efficient, they're getting better at managing their capital, the machines are becoming more efficient, and their operations are growing at scale. What we've seen since the middle of 2019 when those ASICs began coming online is that the sell pressure for miners has begun to change. And just look at how consistent the sell pressure here was in the run-up to the all-time high in 2018 and then even in the bear market capitulation afterward. Look at the consistent outflows from miners here. And then if you look right around this moment, right around September of 2019, this pattern started to change and we had much more consistent inflows for miners. There was clearly a big outflow right here, and based on what I understand from Glassnode, a large portion of this outflow was an old 2011 miner cashing out big. So if we just kind of take this one with a grain of salt right here, we've largely seen net inflows for miner balance for the last two years plus. Their sell pressure is changing. I mean, here, let's just zoom back out so you can see, just look how much sell pressure existed for miners in the years leading up to this new generation of ASICs coming online. Miners, the most consistent source of sell pressure on the network, day to day, month to month, they themselves are now evolving to hodl more. Many North American miners hold most or all of their mined coin now, and they access operating capital through lending and capital markets. They have investors providing capex for them to grow their operations, which allows them to continue hodling. This dynamic did not exist in previous markets. The mining industry as a whole has become much more advanced just in the last two years. And I believe that going forward, this new trend that we're seeing of miners hodling their coins will continue to grow. North American miners are setting a new trend. And as long as easy money policies continue to come out of Washington, D.C. from the Fed, capital will be easily acquired for investors. Lending rates are at bottom basin levels. And as long as we remain in that environment, I think it's reasonable to expect that miners will continue to hodl their coins because they have no reason to sell them at this point if they're receiving capex elsewhere. So we've established that miner activity is changing. They're selling less frequently. Exchanges are seeing their balances decline. 
coins are becoming less available for new buyers and are now at multi-year lows in exchange balances, even though we're now at the all-time high. Liquid supply has been in decline for the last year and a half after a decade of growth, coins being taken away from entities with a history of selling. Here is our HODL waves chart, and right now it's filtered to only show the waves of supply that are three months or older. So this is the distribution of all Bitcoin based on the age it is currently. So the time that it last moved establishes a birth date, so to speak, and that duration from then to now creates an age. And each of these colored cohorts is a different age of coins. The bottom group are three to six months old, all the way up to the purple group here, which are coins that are 10 years or older and we've taken out everything that is younger than three months. So the observation here is that coins that are three months or older now take up the largest percentage of Bitcoin supply that they ever have. There has not been a point in Bitcoin's history where more supply had been sitting stagnant for at least three months than right now. So what that can tell us about the supply is a couple of different things. The first is that activity on chain today is largely consistent of younger coins. Coins stay young by continuing to churn around and not being given an opportunity to age. They tend to age when they're picked up by illiquid types, by hodler types. That's usually when their age grows. And it's important to point out that in the past, in all of the moments previous where three months and older coins had this much of the supply were in bare markets, not in bull markets, not when we were near the all-time high, but when we were very far away from it. This moment here, this knob of supply here, this came in the 2014 to 2017 bear market. After you have a blow off top, many sellers leave and coins just end up sitting around and accruing days and they start maturing. And you get these pushes up in older coin supply. And then it just kind of stays at this level. And as time goes by, coins mature up into these senior age brackets. And throughout this bear market from 2014 to 2017, three month and older coins retained about 75 to 80% of the total supply. And then as soon as we got near all time highs again, there was distribution out of this group. Same thing over here in the 2018 to 2020 bear period. Again, about 80%, a little bit more of supply owned by three month and older hands at its maximum in bear periods after the all time high. And then as we broke the previous all time high, here in December, this group began distributing. Let's zoom in. We're breaking the all time high. Here it is back here in 2017. We take the line across. Here's price creating new highs. Here's distribution of older coins. The supply is going down. And once they sell, once they are satisfied and they get some profit, this group begins net accumulating again. Activity slows down and maturation takes over. They begin growing and growing their stacks. And they now own the most supply that they have ever owned. And we're at the all time high. That is a new wrinkle, my friends. That is not like previous markets. Typically, as we get back to the all-time high, older coins come to life. They seek liquidity to realize profits, and they're sold into strength. And what we're seeing from older hands now is a reticence to sell. They're standing firm as we test the all-time high. There's been very little distribution out of this group. And even though we've now spent a week or more hovering around 60K after breaking the all-time high, we still have not seen distribution from this group in any notable size. Hodling continues to occur. I find this very interesting. And it seems to me that those currently holding Bitcoin are just simply uninterested in 60K as a price point. They seem to be willing to wait for higher prices and they now own more supply than they ever have. So this dynamic is shifting. I do expect we'll see some distribution out of this group before long, but the fact that they've held so strong despite testing the all-time high gives me a lot of confidence that people are beginning to understand Bitcoin a bit better and the concept of hodling is taking root in a more widespread manner. We're seeing that in this behavior here, in the behavior of exchanges in decline, in the behavior of liquid supply in decline, in the behavior of miners selling less than they used to. All of these are telling the same story. The story is hodling. The story is not selling your Bitcoin.
This is the coin days destroyed 90 chart. We've looked at this a few times in previous videos, but it ties into this narrative. This is the barometer for how much coin activity, specifically older coin activity, is happening each day. And you can see that when we get into bull markets, as new prices are made, there is a lot of old coin activity. When coins sit around and they accrue a lot of coin days, and then they are sold, all those coin days get destroyed and added to this orange line. And so when we get large spikes, that means we're seeing a lot of coins with a lot of coin days accrued to them being destroyed at once. That is common behavior in bull runs, in every bull run, as a matter of fact. And right now, we are testing the all-time high, and the amount of old coin activity is at one of the lowest points it has ever been in the history of Bitcoin. The other times it has been this low have been in bear markets. Here, here, bear market. Here, bear market. Here, all-time high test. Completely new paradigm. This has not occurred before, and in fact, this is the quietest run up to an all-time high on-chain in the history of Bitcoin. There has been so little selling, particularly from older hands, that it's a completely new on-chain footprint for Bitcoin in that regard. This dynamic here is totally new. Even this last time that we broke the all-time high, right here, coin days destroyed 90 was elevated. It was in this area. It was leaving this blue basin here. And now we are all the way down here. We're all the way well below this kind of baseline zone that we mark out on the chart here on Glassnode. We spoke about this in the previous video, and I explained how on one hand it could be bearish in the sense that there just doesn't seem to be a lot of on-chain activity right now. But we're at 60,000. We are a single step away from price discovery. An old hands just have no interest in coming to life here. We would be seeing an uptick in this value if there was even a small percentage of the population who was trying to sell here of the older hands. And so far, none of them are. So this dynamic coupled with three month and older coins having the most supply they ever have, miners aren't selling nearly as much as they used to, exchanges are losing coins into price strength, and liquid supply is on the decline. Friends, hodlers are winning. Dollar cost averagers are winning. The properties of Bitcoin as a superior store of value, as the hardest money ever conceived by man, are beginning to take root. And we're seeing them embodied in many of these metrics that we track on chain. Here is the last chart that I'll look at today to really tell this narrative of Bitcoin evolving into a true store of value. This is our smart money chart, and we've got a few lines on here that we'll walk through one by one. And each of these ties back to what we were just discussing with the previous charts. The first thing we'll look at here is long-term holder supply. Long-term holders are folks that have been sitting on their coins for enough time that we consider them unlikely to sell based on statistical history. It's about five months. Once you hold coins that long, you're much less likely to sell them in the near term. We consider these folks to be part of the smart money, and we follow their behavior closely. Long-term holders began selling in November as price was nearing the break of the previous all-time high. This black line is the price for Bitcoin. And this spot right here in December, this is where price was consolidating under the previous all-time high. Here, I'll zoom out to give context. This is the spot we were just speaking about. This over here was the previous all-time high right here. I'm going to turn off these other lines, actually, because it's a bit busy. Here we go. Previous all-time high break. Right here, long-term holders begin selling, right? And then they begin net accumulating sometime in March. The selling from this group begins to peter out, and accumulation is the majority and they begin stacking their corn. They now have the most supply that long-term holders have ever had in the history of Bitcoin. So this group sold, right? They sold as we broke the previous all-time high. That's the behavior that we expect. And they have since began steady and heavy accumulation. And even now, as we've broken the all-time high, while the supply has flattened a bit, there is still accumulation going on in this group. They haven't reversed course like they did here last November. This pink line is the balance of miners. So this is the purse balance that gets represented, the changes in this balance get represented here on minor net position change. So this is the raw BTC balance held by all miners. I mentioned earlier in the video that this selling moment for miners included a 2011 miner that cashed out big. This is a large sell going through. And other than this one little burst right here, miners have then begun accumulating again. There's been a couple of sell moments. This occurred when China Bank 
expand industrial mining. We got a burst of selling here in the middle of the summer, as many of them look to loosen up some capital for their migration to another country. Many of those miners moved to North America. There was also a, a bit of selling here, but largely this group has been on the increase for the last few months. And if there wasn't this large selling event here, it's reasonable to think that they would have just continued to accumulate based on their behavior here. So the miners, by and large, are stacking their coins rather than letting them deplete out of their treasury. And if I zoom out, this is the miner balance from years ago. And if we notice that here in mid-2019, this was around the time when I mentioned that some of these next generation ASICs came online and the miner economy really began to evolve and mature. And you can see since this point, after years of down outflows from their treasury, they've begun accumulating. There was this little sell-off and then they're still accumulating. Accumulating. So this dynamic is different from the past for miners, to be sure. The next thing I want to look at here is illiquid supply shock. So we talked about how there are entities on chain that have a history of selling, and there are those that do not. The entities who are not likely to sell are the illiquid types. These are the hodlers, the sat stackers, those who have a low history of moving coin at all. And this group has been accumulating heavily since late May. We had the sell-off here from the all-time high. This was really when they began to sell. They didn't start selling here when price was breaking the all-time high. They didn't sell during this pullback. They sold at the all-time high. There was a flush out of supply here by this group. But once we reached this bottom in late May, really just a couple of days after the panic portion of the sell-off, they started buying the dip. And they've continued to buy the dip all throughout September and October. October, even as we broke the all-time high, they're still accumulating. These are the individuals on chain who don't sell. These aren't miners. These are just individuals, smaller firms, private companies, hedge funds, family institutions, high net worth individuals, people who don't like to sell. And they have been exhibiting very bullish behavior since late May, and they continue to. Very encouraging. The last thing I'll look at here is the filtered whale supply. So a whale is an entity that has at least 1,000 Bitcoin. And here we filtered out some of the things like exchanges and a few of the ETFs because they don't really represent an individual. And the observations to take away from this whale group is that the top of the market for them was really here in February. We broke the previous all-time high here. Price doubled in a matter of about a month, up to 40K. We saw a pullback. And then as price broke the pullback, as the rally continued from the doubling of the all-time high, right around 40K. As this price broke, this is when whales sold. They sold a fair amount of their supply, held steady through some of the churn here in the spring. Then there was another sell-off in May as price capitulated. And really, since the summer, whales have been accumulating again. They flattened out. There was a bit of churn in this group, some coins leaving, some coins joining, so they stay kind of net flat. And then they began buying here in late July. And they've continued to buy, and there's even a slight uptick here in the last few days. So why am I showing you whale supply? Why am I showing you illiquid supply shock, minor balances, and long-term holder supply? The reason that we wanted to look at all of these, and the reason I've been walking you through these charts, is because I want to paint a picture for you about where Bitcoin is headed and what is going on on-chain with the actual people holding Bitcoin. Take the price chart out of it and let's look at the behavior of the people with Bitcoin right now. We've had a lot of moments in the last few months where there's been scary price action, there's been a lot of negative news, and there have been numerous reasons for people to doubt the near and midterm future for Bitcoin. But despite all of those narratives, despite the media's attempts to scare people away from investing in Bitcoin, despite China's attempts to weaken it, despite all of these things, illiquid supply types have grown their stacks. Whales have grown their stacks. Miners have grown their stacks. And long-term holders continue to accumulate at an historic rate. Meanwhile, exchanges continue to see outflows. And liquid supply continues to be taken away from these investors with a history of selling and put into cold storage, into the hands of hodlers. All of this data we're looking at today is painting a portrait of Bitcoin's evolution and maturity as a store of value. Proof of work issuance, the dynamic difficulty adjustment, and the hard cap of 21 million coins combined make Bitcoin the soundest money we have. 
And as time goes on, as this asset matures, and as the people begin to understand Bitcoin, these properties start manifesting themselves in the data at scale. There are thousands, millions of people contained in this data, and their behavior as a whole is telling us a story. I am very encouraged about the future for this asset. I don't know what price will do a week from now or a month from now, but what I can say is that by and large, the people who hold Bitcoin are beginning to behave as if they understand it in a deeper and more intimate way. They seem more patient, less jumpy, less reactive to news cycles, and more willing to hold on to their investment and see what the future holds. That should give all of us a lot of confidence. That is what I wanted to discuss with you today. The on-chain footprint looks very strong. And if these patterns are demonstrating a new paradigm for Bitcoin going forward, if we can expect illiquid types and hodler types to behave this way going forward, then the future is very bright for all of us invested in Bitcoin. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at TXMC Trades. I post a lot of cool charts and analysis. Some of them make it into YouTube and some of them don't. You'll also find out about other content I'm producing that doesn't make it to the channel. Make sure you leave feedback and questions in the comments. I'll be sure to read them as I usually do. And we'll check back in together in a couple of days to see how the market is behaving. I hope you all had a great Halloween weekend. We'll speak again in a couple of days. Take care of yourselves, friends. Cheers.